The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Well, we continue on in our season of expectation and anticipation that we call Advent. And last week we considered Jesus' words about the, his return. And this week we, we look at how the people in his day were told to get ready for his kingdom, get ready to receive the king. And we hope that um, what we learn will make us a little bit more open to God and God's working in our life. And this passage uh, today that we have is really kind of in keeping with the secular observance of Christmas. You know, we have a uh, religious observance that goes on, and then we also are engaged in a secular observance of Christian, it, it, Christmas. It's kind of hard to distinguish between those two. But um, what I think of this time of year is that, you know, all kids are thinking, man, for just a couple weeks, i got to really be good, you know, because there's a lot of stuff that hangs in the balance here. You know, if I'm, if I'm not good then I'm not going to get this stuff from Santa, you know. And um, remember that process when you were a kid and you're thinking, i got to really, you know, pick my table up, put my clothes away and stuff like that, act really good for at least a month, you know. And then, then there's, uh, you know, all this propaganda, you, you better watch out and uh, you better not cry, you better not pout. I'm telling you why Santa Claus is coming to town. Wow. What a message that is. I mean, what a system. Definitely a parent behind Christmas, right? I mean, all these warnings about Santa. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. I mean, Santa, the great omnipotent one, right? The omniscient one. Uh, everywhere, uh, omnipresence. So kids get this message and they do their best to convince Santa this time of year that they really are very, very good. And the way that they do that, the traditional way, is to write a letter. What better way to state your case than writing a letter? And Santa saves these letters and I just happened to come across a few of them uh, today. So here's the first one. It says, to Santa, I've been a good boy. That's the lead line always, writing a letter to Santa. I've been a good boy. State that up there in case he doesn't read the rest of it. On my list, I've got a DS, DS games, Indiana Jane, Jones uh, Lego, a Wii games, and 20 packs of Matt Chatter. I didn't look up what that was, but it must be good stuff. Um, oh, and then he adds, he says, Mommy says you're fat. He throws Mom under the bus there to Santa. Mom, mom says that you're fat, Santa. I'm not saying that, right? But my mom says you're fat from Archie. Okay, so pretty good uh, typical letter of what we might write to Santa Claus. The second one I, I thought gets a little bit more professional. Dear Santa Claus, I think that I've been good enough this year and that I deserve a present. Good lead line. I think that I've been good enough this year and that I deserve a present. As my parents cannot afford to buy me that doll, I decided to ask you. So in other words, you know, if my parents were had enough money, I'd go to them. But since they don't, I'm going to you. And it's the doll Baby Born. And you've, you've seen this. She eats, drinks, cries, goes to the toilet. Sounds like a child to me, right? <laughs> maybe mom and dad said no because they got one on the way. Who knows? But I would really be happy to get it. So I ask you to bring it to me if you can. Please throw a little begging in there. I know that it's maybe expensive, but you're Santa Claus, he says. You're Santa Claus. You can do anything. And I would like to have the blue one and the white one. 
But since I think I would not get both of them, I'll be satisfied with the one. Now, that's a really good tactic, kids, if you're writing to Santa. Always give him a way out. Ask for way more than what you really want. And that way he can give you something that you do want. See, so, so you ask for two. She does, but she'll take just one. Please, please bring me the shoes for the doll. I really want that doll. And once again, please bring it to me for a new year. Melissa. And the last one, I really like this one. <coughs> Excuse me. Dear Santa, I've been nice this year. I've shared good. I've played with my sister. I've been a good sport. I respect my parents. I eat healthy. <laughs> I do my best on hard tests. I hope you really do understand. I have been nice this year. I really have. Okay, <laughs> that might be a little bit over the top, kids. I mean, it really, I really have been nice. What I'd like for Christmas is a few new Xbox games, some computer games, uh, maybe a couple of Game Boy Advance games. I'd also like some pictures of reindeer, maybe a bell from your sleigh. Hmm. An electric dog. Also, also, a panda bear that was just born yesterday. Just kind of move that in there. If you could get this panda bear from the zoo that's just born yesterday. Yeah. A lightsaber, a leapster backpack, and some leapster games. And for a special touch, maybe a nice book. I'll have cookies waiting. That's that's a good letter, man. He's gonna get all that junk, especially the panda born yesterday. <laughs> oh, even in our secular environments, I think that Jesus uh, has higher. Jesus raises the bar. There are higher expectations at Christmas. I mean, don't try to even deny that. Uh, we all want to be better this time of year. It's Christmas for just a few weeks. We're supposed to be happy. We're supposed to be selfless. And there's this reason for this. I mean, we, we expect more of ourselves and we expect more of this world because God has come into the world in the person of Jesus Christ. And he's shown us what it is to live a, the perfect life. And that raises the bar for every human being. God has said in Jesus, this is how you live. This is what life looks like. And we're like, man, I'm just trying to get to work every day. And here you are raising the bar this time of year. I, I'm not trying to mess this up. And you say, here's your example, Don. Just, you know, live like this. Live like Jesus. So we all may be writing kind of metaphorical letters to Santa this time of year and saying, hey, I've been pretty good. I don't know if you're watching or not, but let me remind you that I'm trying really hard. You know, I really am. Because Jesus has raised the bar. God is the one who does, through Jesus Christ, kind of sort out human lives. His coming to the world forever changes the world. And I want to read a passage of Scripture here. You know the first part of this, but I bet you haven't heard the last part of this, this Scripture in quite a while. It's from John three sixteen to 21. We always stop at John three sixteen, but the rest of the verse tells us a lot. And this is quite a bit to chew on. Uh, so yeah, Jesus says, "...for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son." that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light and so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. That's not a simple passage. It's a rather complex passage, really. But, uh, but one thing is clear uh, that... When Jesus is revealed to people that some run from the light and some run to the light. And, you know, I think that proves out. Jesus says that some move away from him because 
who he is reveals something about them that they don't want to face, they don't want to look at. And I think that he's looking for and hoping to find lives that are looking for the kingdom, lives that want truth. And I think the question that we have to ask ourselves today is, am I open to God? Am, Am I going to the light? Or does who Jesus, who he is, reveal something about myself that I'm not really ready to look at? I mean, could there be anything more dangerous than think than to kid yourself into thinking that you are living in such a way that pleases God when in fact you're not? It's an extremely dangerous thing. Now, the person that we'll be looking at today, as you probably already guessed, is John the Baptist. John the baptizer, literally, John was Jesus' cousin, six months older than Jesus, and Jesus called John the greatest man who ever lived up till now, is what he said about him. That's quite quite a tagline. He called him a prophet. So he, he has a lot, I mean, he really has a compliment about him because a prophet is someone who speaks for God and, and gives God's word and, and says what God really thinks. So when John shows up, there's not been a prophet in Israel for 400 years. It's a long time. And they've been waiting and waiting. And then at, one day out in the desert, this, this man appears and up walks this guy who's, who's wearing this rough kind of black coat that's made out of camel hair. And, and people from Jerusalem 20 miles away are flocking down there to see him and to be baptized by him. And more than that, people up in Galilee, way up in Galilee, they're coming down because we know later on that uh, before they were uh, uh, Jesus' disciples, uh, Peter and Andrew were disciples of John the Baptist. And so they make this trip down there, and he, he got everybody's attention for a while. And one reason that he got people's attention was that he just lived in the desert, a tough area where nobody else wanted to live. And and years earlier, 600 years earlier, Isaiah had said there's going to come a prophet that's going, that's going to announce some good news and he's going to be out in the desert. So, so people paid attention to that. And, and the other, another reason why he got everybody's attention was because he was so poor. And, you know, he, he wears just the crudest of clothing and he doesn't even eat like everybody else eats. Everybody else is eating fish and, you know, figs and barley bread. But John's so poor that he eats locusts. Now, locusts can be any kind of insect that swarms, but something like a grasshopper. So here's John. He's so poor that he takes grasshoppers and then seasons them with honey in order to get them down. And that's how poor he is. And, and I mean, he's just, um, he's like somebody that grows up in the projects and grew up on ramen noodles, you know. Um, people believe him because he's not in the system. He's, he's got nothing to profit by it. So uh, his, his appearance just speaks volumes. He says, I'm, I'm not sold out to the culture. I'm nobody's pawn. And being poor means that I have nothing to lose. So I'm just going to tell it like it is. And then I think another reason why uh, he gets a crowd is he's dressed like the prophet Elijah. And this is what Elijah was dressed like. And Elijah was probably Israel's greatest prophet. And you know, they had said that he's going to return before the day of the Lord. So the day of the Lord means the day when the Lord returns to the earth and he sets everything right. You know, And that's what they were expecting. So he comes... Uh, dressed like him, and he comes and he says, get ready. Now, once John has their attention, what does he say? Well, according to our text, he told the people that they should get ready for God, that they should repent. And, I mean, he has just, just this one simple but very difficult message. He quotes the prophets Isaiah and Malachi. He says, make straight paths for God. God is coming to you and you better repent. John says, came preaching a repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And he says, make a straight way, change your lives, repent, get ready. what, What exactly does he mean? And I think for some people, what it means is that we have to stop doing some of the things that we're doing. And, you know, God is coming and he's not very pleased with some of these things. So there's going to be some trouble. 
got me to thinking about, remember when you were in grade school, you, you younger kids, don't pay attention to what I'm going to say, when, when you were maybe in fourth or fifth grade and the teacher, back in those days, they didn't have cameras when we were in school, the, you know, we would ride our horses. No, we would take the cars there. But uh, it, they didn't have cameras in the, in the classrooms. And the teacher would say, I've got to go down to the office for just a minute. Now, here's your assignment. I want everybody to work on this while I'm gone. No other aid. Teacher's out of the classroom for 10 or 15 minutes. So by the time you get to fourth or fifth grade, you learn how to do this. You put a sentry at the door, sentry at the door, to watch for the teacher coming back because you can hear her heels you know, on the, on the terrazzo floor. And the rest of the kids just go crazy in the room, right? She's gone, all right, you know, and there's be a couple kids that are really wild and the rest of us kind of sit there in our desk, scared to do anything. And, and then you'd hear, you know, the, 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 the sentry say, she's coming, she's coming. And everybody go back to their desk and get their papers out and not even look at her when she walks in. You know, everybody's frozen. She knows what's been going on. Uh, some people kind of think that repentance is like that, you know. God's coming, so you, you better change your act. You better get it, you know. Uh, it's it's kind of like that. Uh, you know, when John the Baptist cries out about the kingdom of God, he's yelling, you know, God's coming. He's going to be here any day. And everyone who heard him said, oh, I don't want to end up in trouble down at the office, so I better straighten my act up, you know, do what I'm supposed to be doing. I, I saw a bumper sticker one time that said, don't make me come down there, signed God. And, and that's the way that some people think. You know, so we got to straighten everything up because he's, he's coming back and he's a little irritated with this, maybe even a little bit mad. And there's, there is an element of truth in that, I mean, in this call to repentance. Uh, Mark begins his gospel with this plain, blunt truth. He says, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. No question there. Jesus Christ, Christus, means Messiah, anointed one. He's the long-awaited Messiah, Son of God. Wow, what a declaration that is. In the first verse of his gospel, he's the long-awaited king. He's the one that we've been watching for. He's the Son of God. He's God coming down to earth. And there's a reason to be in awe and even to use the word fear that God is coming to earth because he's God. And when we lose this element of, of respect and awe and fear of Jesus Christ and reduce him down to just you know a radical or a political organizer or a philosopher or a miracle worker or, the, or even the greatest man to ever live, he's no longer then the son of God, Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah. Yeah, even if he's the greatest man ever. So there's this element and this call of repent that causes us to take inventory of our lives, and rightly so. It says he was baptizing them uh, in the river, for which for us today sounds very positive. Oh, well, he's baptizing. Not so much for them. Uh, the Jewish people practiced uh, ritual cleansing as they went to the temple. But baptism, being immersed in the water, was something for Gentiles to come into the Jewish faith. So what John was doing was saying, your Judaism, your birthright into Abraham is invalid now. You see, you need to get immersed. You, you need to become as a pagan, as a Gentile to come to God because God is coming. And they were doing it. You know, thousands of people were going down there to go through that practice, that this call to repent, get ready for God, is a call to humility. How humbling it would be for the Jew to go through baptism. And even John the Baptist has that humility. It's said that he was the greatest man ever to live, Jesus said, and yet he said, I'm not worthy to untie his sandals. So John the Baptist, the greatest man ever to live, according to Jesus, is, is humble in nature. But there's another side, side to this call to repent. Um, I, think, I think the repentance is really more about the future than it is about the past. And we don't think of this that much. Uh, this, this call by God to us to get ready 
is always a call into the future. It's not just what's going on in the past, but, I mean, are you ashamed of your actions? But it's much more about God coming to you and God breaking into your world in a new way with something new in your life. There's going to be some change. You'll become someone new. He says, make some straight paths because, because God is coming to you and everything is going to change. And we Western Christians, I think that we have kind of turned this into a one-time event. Okay, I, I got saved. I was converted. I was born again. That's a start. But there's a future here that involves repentance. And, and don't miss the end of what John said. He says, I baptize you with water but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Did you miss that? This is getting ready. This is what I would call repenting forward. It's not just about what or who you were or what you did. It's about the future. It's about what God wants to do in your life from now on. God wants to immerse us in himself. That's what baptize means, to immerse. He wants to, he wants to plunge us into the Spirit. God wants to, to fill us with the Spirit. It's not just an experience that somebody has at a, at a revival meeting, but to be filled with the Spirit means that God himself is directing everything, that you are now living a life that's, that's filled with the fruit of the Spirit. God is coming to you and he's, he's, he's asking you to get ready because he wants to pour himself into you. I ran across a story a couple weeks ago, and I checked it out as much as I could. I'd never heard it before. It's quite a remarkable story. If it's true, I think it's true. I did my best Googling on this, and that was about all that I could do. The story does show up on some websites of a county, uh, a government website that gives the history of this county. <clears throat> and the story is that in 1740, uh, a tribe of Indians known as the Skitswish, a small Native American tribe in northern Idaho, had a prophet chief of the tribe called Circling Raven, of whom it was said that he could communicate with crows and ravens. And on Solstice Day of 1740, which is December the 21st, Crow and Raven told this chief that in a land far away, the Creator, who was also the Savior of the world, had been born as a man on that night long ago. And Circling Raven told his people that they should celebrate his Savior's birthday by giving extra sweets and gifts to children. Right on here with Christmas, right? Extra sweets and gifts to children. He also said that the tribe should not fight with each other or even with their enemies during this period before and after this day. And in addition, Raven told him that within a hundred years, men clothed in black robes would arrive with more news about the Creator's Son and the world's Savior. So for the rest of his life, Circling Raven searched for the black robes, and he died with never having found them but his son, uh, the heir, uh, Twisted Earth was his name, became chief, and he kept the practice up for years and years and years. Finally, in 1862, uh, a group of Catholic Jesuit brothers arrived in their area, and Twisted Earth greeted them with joy, they said, and sorrow, because his father had waited his entire life and never saw the prophecy come true. He was happy that the black robes had finally arrived to tell the rest of the story about Jesus, but he was saddened that his father had not lived to see the prophecy fulfilled. He waited and waited, but never realized it. And then a neat story. That God would reveal himself to people through a very... Uh, unusual channels and would prepare them a hundred years before uh, the news was to come to them about Jesus. God had planned that for a hundred years beforehand. Now, I, I just wonder, it got me to think about what's God's plan for us. 
So many Christians have been waiting. I mean, especially this time of year as we talk about the grief of so many, the unrealized dreams of so many. Uh, people are waiting, waiting for God to come to them. And they know that there has to be more. And let me encourage you today that if you are that person, you've been waiting for something for God to do in your life that's greater. Or if, if you are the, the, the friend and the person that's ministering to someone else, let me encourage you to encourage them to not give up. We repent of the past and then we repent forward. Okay? We begin to envision in our minds what God has for us in the person of Jesus Christ. He alone is the Messiah. He alone is the Son of God. And He alone can fill us with His own presence, with the Holy Spirit. And that we would know the, the love and the joy and the peace and the patience and the kindness, the gentleness, the faithfulness, the self-control that He alone can, can birth in us. Essentially, every day John the Baptist comes to us in the desert and he says, I want you to get ready. Every morning when you get up, he's saying, I want you to get ready, okay? Because, because Christ is coming to you today. I want you to repent forward. I want you to live into this day that I'm giving you as if Jesus Christ were living inside of you. God wants to bring to you what's been planned from the beginning of the world. So I ask us today, is God coming to you today? Are you ready? Not just to repent of the past things. Are you ready to live into a future that he's planned for you? How might life change if you believe that? Let's sit for a moment. As deep cries out 